So um, I'd like us to get into our keynote address, and we really thank um, our key guests for coming in here today, and a man who's spearheading this, of course, at the UN body as well, a man who's no stranger to Kenya, a man we all love and, uh, um, and appreciate, and I think we will give him some honorary Kenyan status, for sure. Uh, please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Mr. Siddharth Chatterjee. He's a UN resident coordinator. Welcome, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, and to the CEO of Safaricom, Peter, I'm pleased to make your acquaintance today. My brother Caprono, all the panelists present. You know, it's important for me to reflect on a piece of history, and that piece of history started in 2014, when I actually sat with Sanda Ojiambo, who just spoke before this, and Bob Collimore. And we were, we were talking about the Beyond Zero campaign. We were talking about the high maternal mortality in Kenya. We were talking about Kenya being amongst the 10 most dangerous places for a woman to give birth. And then we talked about what is it that we could be doing to actually change this narrative. And that's when this journey really started, when in September of, of uh, 2015 at the UN General Assembly, Bob Collimore, the former CEO of Safaricom, announced that six companies, and he represented all these companies with their agreement, Safaricom, Huawei, Kenya Healthcare Federation, Philips, Merck, and GlaxoSmithKline. And they said they will join us, three UN agencies, UNFPA, UNICEF, and WHO. Under the leadership of the government of Kenya, we launched into a reduction of maternal mortality program in six of the highest burden counties, Mandera, Vajir, Marsabet, Lamu, Isiolo, Garissa. By the end of 2016, we were able to actually reduce the maternal mortality ratios of, this, of these six counties by one third. And mind you, these six counties represented 50% of the maternal deaths in this country. So the national average in 2014 was 488 deaths per 100,000 live births. So the MDGs, if you recall, was meant to be less than 170. But in a matter of three years, Kenya was able to bring down the national uh, average from 488 to 360. Now that is remarkable because for many countries, this would take 10 to 15 years. But what this demonstrated was the might of this kind of partnership, a public-private partnership, which potentially, when taken to scale, can be so transformative. And we got invited to the World Economic Forum in 2017 to showcase this. And it was then, in January of 2017, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, a decision was taken. That time, C.S. Cleopa Mailu was the Minister of Health. We were having long discussions as to what we should be doing. So we said, let's target universal health coverage as a potential outcome. And I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that President Kenyatta made this one of his top priorities. And perhaps every leader in the world will follow suit because quite clearly COVID-19 has shown us the fragility of humanity in the wake of a pandemic where even some of the most advanced countries where we just assumed that their healthcare systems are so resilient and robust and advanced and sophisticated will be able to weather any storm. And those very countries flipped over. So it was Herophilus, the, the Greek philosopher, who once said that, you know, without health, we have nothing. And therefore, you know, it's the COVID-19 pandemic has struck us like a bolt of lightning. And what it did during that bolt of lightning, that flash, we saw the contours of inequality, which became so stark, so visible. And not just inequality between countries, but inequalities within countries. Suddenly all that, all that came to the surface. So, you know, recently the UN Secretary General and Kenya was invited. You know, it, Kenya is already being seen by many as a trailblazer in the public-private partnership space. And the UN Secretary General at this event, which was hosted by the International Organization of Employers, I was invited on behalf of the UN in Kenya. 
he said at this event that while there is still, and I quote, while there is still a long way to go in the fight against COVID, many countries have been able to contain the spread of the virus. This was made possible in part because of the cooperation of governments, business, trade unions, and many others. The pandemic has reminded us of both the power and the imperative of global partnership, unquote. There are four critical areas that we could already see how we could actually be looking at leveraging this sort of public-private partnerships. And what does the role of the UN become? First and foremost, the UN is here as a national partner with the government and the people of Kenya. It has been involved in the country's development trajectory for a very, very long time. We do not bring the resources of the World Bank or international financial institutions or, or, or major banks. What we do bring is a moral compass to that discussion. What we do bring is our ability to convene, connect, and catalyze. What we do bring is to look at how, first of all, we can actually engage in a multilateral dialogue and we encourage the private sector to become right into the center of this. Secondly, how do we engage here at the national level? So recently, the Dag Hammarskjöld Foundation of Sweden did a study. And Kenya was featured in that study on how the UN is working with the private sector and other partners of unlocking financing, not funding, not looking at the traditional aid environment, but looking at real financing in order to start looking at perhaps the big four agenda. And globally, this is where we see the narrative will start to take shape. Thirdly, every company must, and Safaricom in many ways is leading the way, must be at the forefront in this dialogue of public-private partnerships. And fourthly, we have to invest in business, in jobs, and in growth. Why is that? What COVID-19 has also demonstrated is that old terminology of too big to fail, the biggest have failed, the mightiest have crumbled. The tourism industry has been badly impacted. People have been left jobless. Millions and millions of people jobless. The world is seeing a, 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 a depression, an economic crisis which rivals the Great Depression of the early 1930s. So what does it, what does it mean now? I mean, you know, when John Maynard Keynes, the famous economist, was alive, you know, people never took him very seriously when he said that governments will have to invest in times of crisis in the private sector. And, you know, he was discarded as someone who would not be, whose, whose economic concepts were not relevant. Today, John Maynard Keynes is the man of the hour because many governments have had to resort to bailing out these companies. And it's necessary because jobs are at a loss and all that is happening which means we have an opportunity to define an entire new narrative. And that new narrative is going to be, how do we take charge of the big data, of the technology, of the innovation, and bring it all together to leapfrog the sustainable development goals, as Safaricom has put it here, the race to 2030. And we all have to become an Eliud Kipchoge in that race. Everybody. Let's take the big four agenda. And I'll just give you a, a you know, it, it may sound outlandish, but today the technology and the reality is here. Let's take universal health coverage. When President Kenyatta announced universal health coverage was a priority, many looked at it and said, oh, you know, it's probably not possible to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, if out of the big four agenda there is one thing that we can actually deliver the fastest it is universal health coverage. Why? How do we take technology and innovation and leapfrog? How did we do it in the six northeastern counties of Kenya? It wasn't done because of we went through the normal bureaucratic ways. We trained community health workers. We trained people at the, at the health facilities. We encouraged women to seek uh, care at the facilities because the government had a, had a, had a um, free maternal health care policy, you know, four antenatal visits and, 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 and a delivery and the postpartum care. So the public policy was in place. How do you encourage people to do that? 
We need a million jobs every year. Every year. Between the age group of 15 to 26, one million Kenyans are looking for work. And this is going to be the demographic trend over the next 10 years. Can you imagine that we actually start training young people in schools by the time they're about to leave in healthcare? They become technologically savvy with a backpack. It's happening right now in the, in the, in the Kibera slums. You actually have a midwife with a backpack connected to the internet and she's able to actually go house to house and deliver seven to eight children. Can you imagine what the potential of that is? And imagine if we can actually pay that young person 100 shillings a day. And that, that money can, be, can also be found. It's all, it's all here. It's all within the market. We can create an army of community health workers and we would actually be able to ensure that we achieve universal health coverage in the next two to three years. And it's not difficult to do. What is universal health coverage all about? It is about prevention. Today, many of our behaviors have changed. What is, it hangs, the COVID-19 hangs like the sword of the democles over our head. It has forced us to wash our hands. It has forced us to maintain physical distancing. It has forced us to wear a mask. It's not impossible to start changing these very behavioral trends. It's like the impact of HIV and what it did in terms of strengthening community health care. This is precisely what we need to do. Agriculture. I come from a country where the population of the country is 1.3 billion. 1.3 billion. We are soon overtaking China. India achieved food security by the late 70s into the early 80s. How? In 1966, India was under the throes of a severe famine. And on an average, we used to lose million to two million people used to die because of these famines. President Lyndon Johnson, the US president then, was at war with Vietnam at that time. And he says, you know, we have to deal with the famine in India like a war. So he sent down experts and a gentleman by the name of Lester Brown who came to India and they looked at what the potential of India was and the word green revolution was coined by the US, by the USAID administrator. And look what happened. In a matter of 20, 25 years, suddenly India went on to becoming food secure. Kenya, ladies and gentlemen, could potentially be the breadbasket for all of Africa. We have everything here. What took India 30 years can today be done in five years. You have the seeds, you have the technology, you have the tools. Today, a drone can take off and pinpoint which are the areas that need drip irrigation and it will start to grow. Go to Turkana, go to Lodvar and see some of these oases, which also has severe food insecurity. You'll find oases of, of great agricultural produce. Turkana is sitting on water bodies that can actually service Kenya with fresh water for 70 years. It's just extremely expensive to pull it out. How do we get the private sector investors to come into that space? How do we use big data technology and innovation to reform and change the agriculture sector? We will become food secure much faster, much quicker. Affordable housing. Today, the government has said that we want to have 500,000 houses by 2022. But Kenya's immediate need is 2 million houses. Immediate. That is what we need in the affordable housing space. How do we, how do we industrialize affordable housing? Again, the technology is here. There are countries which have already gone on to 3D printed technology. Today, houses can be done into 3D printed. So someone asked me, oh, what about the jobs? Actually, you'll generate many more jobs because you still need many more plumbers, masons, electricians, carpenters to do the fittings and fixtures in those houses. But those houses get ready in eight hours. How do we go into that kind of league? Now, that's where our imagination needs to go. Let's look at the manufacturing sector. I mean, today, Kenya is primed towards the green economy. 70% of its, of, its, of its power comes from thermal. Imagine the potential that Kenya has to start actually working. And the Africa free trade area gives us a huge opportunity to allow that free movement of goods, services, and people. Ladies and gentlemen, the reality is by 2050, the population of Africa will be 2.3 billion, of which 850 million will be young people. The median age of Kenya is 18. The median age of Sweden is 47. The West is aging. 
the Asian tigers are aging, you still need markets. You still need producers and consumers, which means that we have to invest in human capital because how will they consume if they are left impoverished, as we've seen? How businesses have got lost simply because people lost an income, people lost an opportunity, people lost their wherewithal of existence. So which means that that investment has to take place in human capital in order to maintain human resilience. So we have undertaken with the government of Kenya what is known as a socio-economic recovery plan, the entire UN family, and our key priorities of that is health first. Like I said, there's no health, there is nothing, and that, we, that has been shown. So the famous words of Herophilus today have become even more relevant than it was yesterday. The second is protect people. Protect people from joblessness, protect people from vulnerability, leave no one behind. The third is look at jobs and economic recovery. How do we rewire, rekindle, reimagine, rearrange the ecosystem in which we work today? Fourthly, look at the macroeconomic enterprise. Just before this, I was talking to Kiprono and I were having a chat, and he says, you know, why don't we start looking at capital markets? Absolutely, this is what is the need of the hour, is to make Kenya not, not sitting at 59 in the ease of doing business, but get it into the top 20. Let's look at the whole macroeconomic enterprise. Let us look at making India, uh, Kenya the best foreign direct investment destination. Today, actually, Kenya, regrettably, with all the advances it is making in the neighborhood, it ranks the lowest in FDI compared to Tanzania or Uganda or Ethiopia. We have to change that. And finally, it's about social cohesion. You know, when people get left behind and there's a deep sense of angst and worry and marginalization and a sense of fragility, do you start seeing pockets of, of instability, of violence? And that must never happen. Democracies are all a marathon. At one point, you speed up. At one point, you slow down. But you keep running. And that has to be the spirit. So we must all of us have a major stake, particularly the private sector, particularly business leaders, in making sure that our collective resolve in coming out of this crisis must not at any point be jeopardized by, by vested interests or anything else. And that is why the UN Secretary General constantly reminds us. He says that the world is in pieces and we need world peace. We've got 75 million people today displaced as a result of poverty, as a result of conflict, as a result of environmental impact in their surroundings. In my view, Kenya is a beacon of hope in a region of great instability. What Kenya does will be emulated by many. The blueprint that we establish in the sort of a partnership of bringing the public sector, the private sector, the new or the renaissance of multilateralism, it will become the blueprint for the rest of the continent. God bless Kenya. Thank you. And it is a relay race. It is one that we will run together. We will win together. And there we go, the symbolic handing over of the torch as the race to 2030 is well and truly on. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a round of applause as he hands that over to the private sector, taking the lead there, manufacturing, and we win every single time. And we pledge right here today, I think some great opportunities here, Safaricom, for you, pledging here and now today to continue in its quest to 2030 